How courageous are you? Somewhat? Any heroes present? All cowards? What are the pictures in your mind if I ask you about courage? Dragon slayers? Fearless warriors? Superheroes with muscles? Or a cape? What about Anne Frank and the people hiding her? Mahatma Gandhi? Protesters in Belarus? An Ukrainian family in a bomb shelter trying to survive? Maybe an Afghan woman going to work? Or a refugee in an overfilled rubber boat out on the sea? Firefighter in a burning house? Or a woman leaving her violent husband? In all of these situations, people are exposed to a direct physical threat. It's about life and death. So I don't know about your life, but my life compared to this situation is delightfully unexciting. Yet, almost every day, there is at least one situation where I have the feeling that there's a discrepancy between where my comfort zone is and where the zone is where I suppose that the magic is going to happen. So maybe courage is not just about life and death, but it's about being vulnerable. Not necessarily physically, but maybe financially, like giving up your secure job for something else, something more meaningful maybe, or um, telling your boss that you want a pay raise or, or criticizing her. Maybe you don't want to do both things at the same time, though. It can also be social vulnerability, say um, a person coming out or standing up against a discriminating joke. Or uh, agreeing to giving a TEDx talk, maybe. It can be emotionally, like uh, confessing your love to someone who might not return your feelings. Or breaking up because okay simply isn't good enough. In all of these situations, we expose ourselves personally. We are vulnerable. You might lose your job, a loved one, be ridiculed, feel ashamed. So it all comes down, really, to losing your pack, losing your tribe. And in the very old days, being alone meant you were very prone to die very soon. So indirectly, it has to do with life and death. But at least for us, here and now, everyday courage usually is not life-threatening. But somehow, our brains don't seem to know. It was just a few days ago when I tried to explain to my eight-year-old son that courage might look quite different on the outside than it feels on the inside. So while on the outside it may feel strong and impressive and thrilling and self-assured, inside it might feel small or frightening or unpredictable. Fear and courage are siblings. If there's no danger, there is no need for courage, honestly. Fear, actually, per se, is nothing bad. It actually serves us. It saves us. Just think about the hungry saber-toothed tiger or your boss after you called him a moron or your lover's husband. Graves are full of overconfident optimists. However, fear can also hold us back. 80% of success is showing up. If we don't dare to show up, we have 100% certainty we will not be able to succeed. So what is it, really, that makes us courageous? Interestingly, fear. The need, the necessity to be courageous out of desperation. This is why people who have nothing to lose are the most courageous and the most dangerous. Our instincts make us courageous. And sometimes they come in disguise, in emotions like love. See. I might seem like a fairly friendly person, but I'm also a mom, and you don't want to mess with my child. Thrill, competition, and ambition bring our adrenaline levels up and our risk perception all the way down. Actually, drugs can have exactly the same effect on us. Our worthy goals, strong values, convictions, 
can be delusions, it can go all the way to blind radicalism. Just like fear, courage isn't per se bad or good. It can actually take a lot of courage to do something absolutely despicable. Self-confidence, because it reduces the entry level to being courageous and expands our comfort zone. You can try to expand your comfort zone by being prepared, having trust in your skills, or having a fallback strategy. And most importantly, being courageous makes you courageous, because courage is a habit. By using your courage muscle, you can train it like any other muscle uh, in your body. Nature is constantly adapting and changing. Yet our brains are surprisingly hardwired against change. The oldest parts of our brain, this is where our structure comes from and our emotions, wants everything to stay exactly the same. Because whenever something is different than we know, this might potentially reduce our resources and hence reduce our fitness to survive. This is why any form of change for example, innovation, always causes tension and insecurity. So we need ways of coping with this insecurity and this tension. One of those ways, one of those coping mechanisms is adding structure in order to preserve. This is why insecurity fosters bureaucracy, which gives us security and very efficiently buries any boldness. In most organizations, there is a very strong self-censoring instinct among employees. Everyone has their threat detection radars on, just very anxious of what is supposed, what is supposed to them, what they're supposed to do. Bill Treasurer defined the three kinds, or buckets, as he called it, of courage that it needs for innovation and change in an organization. Number one, try courage being active, initiating innovation, taking a risk, being visionary. You'll all agree with me, this is what innovation is all about. But unless you're super duper lucky, this alone will not lead you anywhere. Well, maybe into a blank disaster. Because what you also need is tell courage. The courage to voice concern, an opposing opinion, constructive dissent. Just imagine everyone is all into innovation and visionary ideas and everything is super cool and unconventional and then you're the one to say, ah, sorry, colleagues, but you don't want to be the party pooper. Tail courage actually is not a showstopper. It has the power to prevent showstoppers because we have to see and acknowledge risks and obstacles that might come along on the way. In order to give room for these two kinds of courage, we need trust courage. Giving each other the benefit of the doubt. Having faith in each other's, in each other's motives and skills and abilities. You have to be credible about being open yourself, because otherwise you'll not be able to make your team feel secure in what they're doing and give them a feeling of, of, of trust you put in them. When I'm only open to ideas I came up with that fit into my picture and I can control, I'm not credible in being innovative and open. If I give trust to a person, I give this person a lot of freedom, but I also give this person a huge chunk of responsibility and personal accountability, and that can be overwhelming and super scary. So when we're asked to be innovative, we are really asked to lay our vulnerability on the line for something greater than our pride, because we're risking failure and rejection. Anyone who's cooking knows that it helps to have the right and high-quality ingredients to get a yummy meal on the table. If you have the skills, you can go from edible to delicious, and maybe you also want to 
season your meal according to your taste. So when you're the chef, uh, and uh, you might want to add those four basic ingredients to your organizational courage soup. Number one, motivation. Having a worthy goal you can stand for and you can follow. This also includes committing, committing the necessary resources and making credible decisions with, which is aligned with those things you're asking for. Resilience to setbacks. This is especially important for those who are initially not courageous. Diverse teams. Innovation is all about sharing, discussing, integrating various views and perspective, ideas and knowledge. It's about different skill sets and roles, not about individual heroes. It's also important, and it helps to create a feeling of securities, to make decisions together. Because together, we are just less alone. Allow me a short detour to something which sounds like the antitoad of innovation, hierarchy. Popular formula goes, eliminating hierarchy equals innovation. But early innovation processes can be quite messy. The team might get ineffective and unstructured. There might be conflicts, uh, incompetent yet bombastic pseudo-experts may run the show. This is where leadership needs to kick in to get the team back on track and moving in the same direction, to facilitate bonding within the team, to select and consolidate ideas, to structure the process, to make and defend difficult decisions, to make them safer, to exhibit themselves. The leader sets the tone and creates the vibes. The last and maybe the magic ingredient is setting the right culture. It should be a culture where courage is valued and blame is avoided. A culture of responsibility. You don't want a pack of gamblers and daredevils to run the show and decide your fate. It's a culture where you're seeking forgiveness rather than ask for permission. Honestly, it takes the ultimate detox program against threat detection systems in your organization. But no one said there was such a thing as free lunch, so this won't be easy, right? What I want to tell you is that courage is nothing that's either there or not. Courage is something that you can cultivate and make grow. Dragons come in different forms and sizes, in different colors and contexts. The dragons that visit me in my office are different than those that visit me at home or that I meet out on the street. They change over time, some grow, almost all of them shrink. My dragons will be different from your dragons, and from yours, and from yours. Our lives shrink and expand in proportion to our courage. We can all be dragon slayers, and honestly, we all have been. Let's try to be dragon slayer just a bit, bit more often. At home, at work, everywhere. Dragon Slayers reinvented. Thank you.